Good morning once again as we come together to look at the book of James. We're turning into James chapter 3 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to James chapter 3. And we're going to read from verses 13 through to 18. So please turn with me to that passage and we'll read God's word together. James 3 at verse 13. James writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Amen, and we thank God for his inerrant word to us this morning. Let's just come together in prayer. Let's pray together as we go together to God's word by turning into that passage we read. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of turning into your inerrant word that word which is the very truth and conveys the reality of your existence as the one true creating God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come to you this morning, O Lord, bearing our burdens, our worries, our sorrows. We come, O Lord, with hope and expectation. We come in various moods, O Lord, asking that we can meet with you and that you would address us through your word to bring us comfort, to bring us healing, to bring us hope, to rebuke, to encourage, to put us on the right path, to build us up, and so bless us in diverse ways because we're all individuals, we're all different, but we're all made in the image and likeness of your Father. And we confess, O oh Lord, we've marred that image by our sin, we are not really true reflectors of the light, the love, and the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, because our image is marred by sin. And we come before you, O Lord, asking for forgiveness. Forgiveness, O Lord, for our sins, the sins of word, thought, and deed, and how these words of James speak to our fallen condition, and Lord, we lack wisdom. We lack so much. And sin is what holds us back. Because we allow ourselves to be tied to this world rather than to your world. We want to pursue our own way instead of your way. And so we stray from the path that is narrow onto the broad path to perdition. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, we pray. And take us, O oh Lord, from the broad path to restore us and put us back on to the path that is narrow. It leads to life itself and all its fullness through Christ our Lord. Father, as we face another series of problems due to this pandemic, we pray, Father, for those who are on their own and lonely, worried, can't have people into their house, can't go out. O oh Lord, for them we pray for comfort and assurance of your presence. And we reflect that many, of course, are advancing in old age who know you what. And of course, as they get older, Lord, the time for coming before you gets nearer day by day. Lord, for those who have neglected matters spiritual, having learned them in their childhood, in their youth, and then gone the way of the world, we pray, Father, for you to speak by your spirit to them 
that they would come to know you before it is too late. Lord, we recognize it is dust we come from, it is dust to one day we shall return. And from that dust you'll raise us up again, Lord, into that glorious body, in the image and likeness of your Son, for what he achieved for our sakes. We're really grateful, Lord. And we look forward to the day when we are called to you to be able to stand in glory, singing the praises of the Lamb that once was slain. So we pray you'd continue with us, your spirit would guide us, and always be our constant companion. For we ask these our prayers in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this morning is entitled Wisdom Part One. In the previous two weeks, we have looked at verses 1 to 12, <coughs> excuse me, and that had to do with the tongue. And here in verses 13 to 18, James contrasts wisdom that is from heaven and the wisdom, as he put it, that is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Now, James makes it very clear in this little letter of his that there is a place called hell. And there are two destinations, two destinations, when this heart stops beating. One is heaven, one is hell. And we know that many people are on the road to hell. And that's the thing people don't like to be told about, even in church. They get all uptight about it. Oh, we don't need to know about that. We don't want to hear about that. Well, you know, the Old Testament, the New Testament in particular, our saving Lord, addressed hell on many occasions. And he dealt with the demonic factor. And so James is saying, if we pitch ourselves into this world and rely on the wisdom of this world, then at the end of the day, it is demonic. It's from the very pit itself. And we should be striving and looking and praying for on a regular basis to receive the wisdom that comes down from above so that we can be better Christians, more equipped in this world to talk about the things that really matter. Christ, salvation, an eternal life. So this morning, we're looking at wisdom part one. You see, if you're wise, filled with wisdom from above, then your life is not focused on self, but is focused on going outward, serving others, serving God. Now, today, as we know, knowledge is spread with alacrity around the globe because of the internet. But in the midst of this increased knowledge, wisdom is practically non-existent. Few would argue that the incredible leap in knowledge has been paralleled by a corresponding leap in the common sense wisdom, not to mention spiritual and moral wisdom. So we have this great burst forth of knowledge, but there's no parallel bursting forth of wisdom. If anything, man's understanding of what he's doing and why he's doing it seems to decrease as his practical knowledge increases. A person may be very intelligent and almost a genius in their particular field and yet still lack godly wisdom, wisdom from above. And that, of course, is where we are in the world today. There are more and more people say science is going to save us. No, it won't. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only saviour of the world. There's no code matrix. There's no code redemption. There is only one saviour, one Lord Jesus Christ. And it all came into a beginning, as the Bible says, in the beginning Genesis 1, 1. 
And then John takes that up in his majestic gospel. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Now, all these scientists who are going to save you, they're not going to save me because I am saved. I'm born again. I'm regenerate. But they're going to save you if you're not born again. Don't believe that there is a savior, Jesus Christ, who will save if you come to him. And we get this in Proverbs. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom and whatever you get, get insight. I like this little story. A little boy came to his father and asked him, Dad, who made God? The father engrossed in his newspaper, looked up and spoke to his son, beats me, son, head down into the newspaper. The boy wouldn't be put off, so I asked another question. Dad, why is the earth round? His father answered, I don't know, son, and continued reading. The boy played with his toys for a few minutes, then he asked, Dad, is there life on other planets? The father patiently looked over his paper and said, nobody knows the answer to that, and got stuck in again to the paper. But the boy suddenly said, Dad, you don't mind me asking these questions, do you? The father put his paper down and looked at the boy and he said, of course not, son. How else are you going to learn? The word wisdom is often used in a careless way today, but its origins in history is vastly different. Put at its highest, wisdom is nothing less than one of the great attributes of God. We read this in the book of Job. With God are wisdom and might. He is counsel and understanding. God has complete knowledge of everything. All his actions are perfect and his judgment is infallible. Wisdom from above is something we ought to seek. For there's a vast difference between the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. So what I want to do is to look at, firstly, the fruit of heavenly wisdom. Secondly, the fruit of earthly wisdom. And thirdly, the life of of divine wisdom. So firstly, the fruit of heavenly wisdom. Please look at verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Having concluding his address regarding the tongue, James now sets about questioning the recipients of his letter. Earlier, James had said, we're saved, reborn, regenerated by the implanted word, chapter 1, verse 18 and 21. Now he returns to the gift of God. And among the gifts of God are humility, wisdom and self-control. And these gifts allow us to resist evil within ourselves and in the world in which we live. Of course, our progress is partial, yet by God's grace working in us, progress is possible nonetheless. And progress is James' goal as he writes this section to those who are receiving his letter. If we're wise, we show it by our life over a span of years. It's not something that suddenly comes to us the minute we're born again, the minute we're regenerated, the minute we surrender our lives to Christ. It's something that develops within us. And what James has in mind is our customs, our way of life, our lifestyle. And he asks, who is wise and understanding among you? If someone claims to be, James says, it should show itself in two ways, by their lifestyle and by their deeds done with wisdom. When scripture bids us to imitate someone, it leads to an exemplary life, not law. It bids us to look to a model of excellence, it is not so much as a command as an invitation, an invitation 
to follow somebody's example, somebody who lived an excellent life. Now, of course, we know full well that many of the people in Scripture, if not all, bar the Lord. Those who are held up as heroes of faith all had their moments, all had their sins. But they all obeyed God and they all sought forgiveness. And these people are pillars of examples that we should look to. And of course, chapter 11 of Hebrews, that great list of Hebrews of the faith, eh, heroes of the faith, that's a very important passage in the New Testament. So we should look at people like Abraham. We should look at people like Jesus. And he is not just the one exception. He is the excellent exception par excellence. He is the one true example of what we should be doing all the time. But we should look at lives that stir admiration and think, surely we want to be like that. Now, a Christian is obligated to keep God's laws. But Christian living is far more than mere law keeping. It's all very well thinking. I do certain things pagans don't do. I read the Bible, I pray, I come to worship, I am involved in spiritual things, I witness for Christ, I write, I preach, so on and so forth. And of course, I avoid certain things that pagans are involved in. I don't get drunk and pour myself onto the floor. I don't like snorting cocaine. I've never tasted, never done it. I wouldn't know even where to start. I've never taken any fancy pills, LSD, ecstasy, or any of these other things. And certainly, I sometimes end up having recorded a program on television, be it a film or a, a play or something like that. And then I could be very, very little time into it, and off it goes, deleted. Thank you and good night. Goodbye. Simply because the language, the content is abominable. I don't want that in my house. I have to hear if I walk down the street and go through a supermarket. But I don't have to have it in my own house coming out of speakers and my own television into my own living room. The Christian life includes good deeds and obedience to the law. But there's more than that. We also bear the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, 23. And as John tells us, we are transformed by the renewal of the mind. Sorry, that's Paul saying that. And then we have spring of water welling up to eternal life, says Jesus in John's gospel. And the images of fruit and wells of water teach that Christian life involves more than mere rule keeping. The Greeks despised humility. They prized the intellect of fallen man, very much like today. The scientists are going to save us. That's where I started, and that's where the Greeks are in a sense. We don't want anybody humble and meek. We want somebody whose intellect is so great, we're admiring them. And of course, today, scientists, they're the ones that are going to save us. We keep being told that. But I can assure you, place your faith in science and you'll be going down into the pit of hell come the day of days and the day of judgment when you're standing the great assizes and you're asked, what do you believe? I believe science will save me. Oh, well, there you go. Down you go. No joke. But people have to align themselves with one thing or another. And if they're not going to align themselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, then hell is where people will go. Now, the Greeks considered humility to be a totally servile posture to adopt. And of course, Christ is the greatest example of humility. And today, there are very few male role models who display humility. Indeed, I have to say, I am unable to put before you names that would be role models who display humility. Now, I suppose if I trawled away for long enough in Google, I could have come up with some people of the 18th, 19th, 20th century, some of the great preachers of the past, like people like Spurgeon and so on. But essentially, 
walking around today on their two hind legs, I am unaware of real role models for young men and young women too, let it be said. Remember the Pharisees, they were the ostentatious men who prayed standing up and in street corners and when they fasted they put white ash in their faces so others would know, they would know what they were about. And when they gave, they made it sure that their donations rattled into the great receptacles in the temple so that everyone could hear what they were doing and giving. They were full of themselves. They were not humble people. There are people today who let the world know how hard their life is. They also like to tell us what good they're doing. James says the wise Christian show he's living the good life by works done in the meekness of humility. Good works that come from wisdom are done in humility. Matthew Henry wrote about the relationship between meekness and wisdom. So this great Puritan put this, it is a great instance of wisdom prudently to bridle our own anger and patiently to bear the angers of others. And as wisdom will evidence self in meekness, so meekness will be a great friend to wisdom. When we are mild and calm, we are best able to hear reason and best able to speak to it. Wisdom produces meekness and meekness increases wisdom. And that is virtually Christ that he's addressing. There was Christ before the mob and Pilate. There he was in meekness as the crowd bayed for his life. I wonder how many of us would have stood there in calm humility. We would have been coming up with all kinds of excuses or lashing out in rage. But Jesus didn't. He stood his ground, meekly accepted what was coming his way because he knew what was going to happen. He also knew for whom he was doing it for. And he was doing it for you and for me, that we might have our sins forgiven, that we might have eternal life and be in his presence for all eternity. So James is telling us of the value of wisdom and understanding and that this shows itself in a life of goodness, in actions humbly done. In the year 117 AD, a preacher called Ignatius, who came from Antioch, was condemned to death as a Christian. He was sent to Rome to be cast before wild animals in the arena as a form of entertainment for the Roman citizens. A squad of ten soldiers accompanied him on the long journey, and he wrote seven letters over the time that he travelled with these soldiers. And in these letters, there is no trace of bitterness. On the contrary, they're full of gratitude for kindnesses received on the journey. His one concern was to be found in Christ and Christ alone. And these letters of Ignatius reveal the meekness of wisdom. And secondly, the fruit of earthly wisdom. Please look at verses 14 to 16. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Look what James puts down in verse 14. Bitter jealousy. This is clearly sinful jealousy. In Acts 13, 44-45, we read this. The next Sabbath, 
Almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. At Antioch, believing Jews were jealous of the attention the apostles were getting from the Gentiles. The Gentiles were excited by the message that Paul proclaimed, and they were wanting to hear more of what he was saying. And so, of course, they gathered on the next Sabbath, and it was more of by word of mouth that more people were there than the previous week, all done by gossiping the gospel. The crowd, naturally, were predominantly Gentiles, and that made the Jews anxious, angry, and envious. And the second is selfish ambition in verse 14. Just like today, people strive to get ahead. They try to get into better positions. And the focus of this worldly wisdom is always for self. Self is guided by self-interest and self-gratification. What's in it for me? That's the big driving force in this world. What's in it for me? And of course, the predominant motivation in the business world is selfish ambition. The aim is always increased margins by ruthless cutting costs, increasing sales, endeavouring to diminish competition, all to contribute to larger profits. James then goes on to say, jealousy and selfish ambition are driven by Satan. And he is the most envious of creatures. He was driven by envy, driven by jealousy, driven by his own selfish ambition that he could arise and take the throne on which the Lord God Almighty sat. And of course, his rebellion was brought about by his envy. And his fall from heaven resulted in the fall of man. And since then, Satan has fueled the fires of jealousy to cause men and women to commit many sins of the flesh. James goes on in verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Those who boast in their wisdom don't have true wisdom. Consequently, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Pride and selfishness and jealousy divide. And these sinful attitudes separate people and put individuals at odds with one another. And these sinful attitudes also produce every vile practice. Selfish ambition, every vile practice imaginable, came to power in Germany, with all that's from the pit in the Nazis in the 1930s. All was supposed to be for the greater good, but we know where that greater good led. The Holocaust, tens of millions of people losing their lives, all for the glory of one man, Adolf Hitler. That's the result of a national party whose sole goal is to control a population. The commentator David Nystrom writes, speaking for the government of Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald in the House of Commons on the 23rd of March 1933, Anthony Eden said that it was necessary to appease Hitler because if appeased, his anger would cool and Germany would become sensible and stable. Appeasement at first meant allowing Germany to break the conditions of the Versailles Treaty and forge a military arsenal 
equal to that of France. It meant descent into the cataclysm of yet another world war. And we can see that today. We can see that with the pandering to Iran. Iran is taking the West for a ride. And they're building up their weapons, including the ability to deliver a nuclear strike. And of course, this business of trying to appease and they'll come and they'll come to line up with the West in terms of Western values, Western morals, and so on, doesn't work. Time and time again, appeasement ends up in a big confrontation. And it's the same. We can't enter in and appease anything that the devil produces or says or wants. We have to be very firm and say no, no, a thousand times no. We don't compromise. We don't appease. And we have to hold the ground. There is but one Lord and one Savior. And we don't gain by denying that or agreeing that there are other saviors or other ways up the mountain to God. That's appeasing Satan. We must stand firm and declare there is but one way, Jesus Christ. And thirdly, the life of divine wisdom. Please look at 1718. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Proverbs 9 and 1 says, Wisdom has built her house. She's hewn her seven pillars. James gives us seven characteristics, seven pillars of true wisdom, if you like. Let me quickly run through them. Firstly, Divine wisdom is first and foremost pure and undefiled. Jesus Christ was pure and never sinned. We are to be like Jesus, having the same moral integrity. The inner essential characteristic of divine wisdom and its overarching attribute is having moral integrity. The Holy Spirit, who is the very wisdom of God, makes us holy. So we find this declaration, consecrate yourselves, therefore and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Keep your statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And secondly, wise people are not troublemakers, but peacemakers. The wisdom from above makes and promotes peace, it stops fights, brings about reconciliation. Note, reconciliation, not appeasement. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. That doesn't mean peace at any price, because that is what appeasement is, peace at any price. Paul says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peaceably with all. Of course, there are conditions, and I've touched on them as we've gone through this passage. We can't compromise the Bible. We can't compromise the truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, his divinity, his atonement, and that fact that he is the only saviour of sinners and there's none other, and so on and so forth. In Christ is the wisdom of God. He made peace between God and man, and man and man. He is our peace. And the Bible tells us there is no peace for the wicked. So the wicked have to come before God and repent of their wickedness to receive the gift of saving faith. But there is heavenly wisdom and there's also the fruit of the Spirit including love, joy and peace. God's wisdom brings estranged people into fellowship with him and others too. So we read this in the book of Acts. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship 
to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And the third thing is divine wisdom is characterized by reasonableness. It speaks of a person who is gentle, courteous, considerate, and willing to yield. Again, our perfect example, as Peter records, is our Savior. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body in the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Fourthly, divine wisdom identifies a man or willing who is willing to submit to God's will. James writes in verses 6 and 7 of the fourth chapter, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Grace has a constant characteristic. A man cannot receive it until he realizes his need of it, and he has to come to God pleading for help. Therefore, it must always remain true that God sets himself against the proud and lavishly gives his grace to those who are humble and obedient to him. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And James writes, mercy triumphs over judgment. Chapter 2, verse 13. God is rich in mercy, and we are saved by God's mercy that flows from the cross of Christ. Therefore, we are to show mercy in practical terms, just as the good Samaritan did. And as John the Baptist demanded of the crowds who came to him in the bank of the River Jordan, which Luke records, tax collectors came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you're authorized to do. Soldiers also asked, And we, what shall we do? And he said, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. You see, it's not saying to the tax collector, don't collect taxes. There's a realism here. Money has to be used for various purposes. But don't skim great chunks off the top in order to put it in your own back pocket. And obviously soldiers, like tax collectors, extorted money too. And they're told, you're paid a wage, you get your food and board, don't steal or force money or make false accusations. And so James is saying, we need to seek God's mercy daily because we have a merciful God who's ever ready to hear us when we come to him and sixthly divine wisdom keeps the covenants it is undivided and unwavering in its covenant loyalty those who have divine wisdom must keep their oaths and promises and mustn't be double-minded say what you mean and don't go and change the minute you're out the door and down the road. And seventhly, wisdom from above is without hypocrisy. Those who have divine wisdom are authentic, sincere, genuine and transparent. It's very much what you see is what you get. Paul writes, let love be genuine. That is to say, no hypocrisy, no play acting, no ulterior motive. You know, there is such a thing as covered love, which gives affection with one eye on the gain which may result. And there is such a thing as selfish love, whose aim is to get far more than to give. Christian love is cleansed of self, and it is pure 
outgoing from the heart to others with the love of Christ, with the mercy of God, reaching out to help and bring others to know Christ as Saviour and Lord. True wisdom is heavenly in nature, spiritual in essence, divine in origin. An analysis of several New, Co New Testament scholars says that for James, wisdom from above is the wisdom promised by Christ, which was poured out on the day of Pentecost. That was a genuine change, the pouring out of the Spirit at Pentecost. Therefore, James does not refer to the Holy Spirit directly in his letter. Instead, he uses the words wisdom from above as a synonym for the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's wisdom. And it is only through Christ that we can be reconciled to God. And the chasm that separates us from God is bridged by the work of Christ, his finished work on the cross. For in Christ is the forgiveness of sin. In Christ is the hope of glory to come. In Christ is the hope of unity within the human community as he draws to himself those whom the Father has given him. He is the source of the righteousness we need in order to stand unafraid in the presence of a holy God whom we're called before him on the day of days. Have you given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you turned to him so that he is your Lord and Saviour? And the one who gives you wisdom from above. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Father, we would seek faithfully day by day. Your guidance, your blessing. And also your wisdom. So that whatever we do, work or deed. We would be now working of our love for you and revealing the Saviour's love for others as we encounter them in our daily walk. Continue with us, we pray, even during these dark days of this pandemic. Encourage and bless us, we pray, for we ask these things all in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, until next week, please stay safe, keep yourself healthy, and God willing, we'll be turning into James next week. Bye and blessings.